Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast. And here we are in South Australia, in Adelaide, at the Australian and New Zealand Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting. And, and part of that is, uh, is that we get to meet a whole lot of interesting companies that, that are doing stuff in nuclear medicine. And, uh, and Australia is one of the world leaders um, in Theranostics. There's, there's quite a yep. few Theranostic companies in Australia. And, um, and, uh, and, and they're all starting to leverage the, the great work that's been done um, um, in, for a long time now in uh, what was originally neuroendocrine tumours, yep. then prostate therapy, and now alpha therapy, um, all of which is uh, benefiting two types of cancers at the moment, or if you say three, because we really should be starting with radioiodine, yeah, and, yeah. and, and, which is the best theranostic of all uh, for a specific cancer. But, but really, um, uh, that's one of the things that it's driving uh, nuclear medicine in Australia and, and now being uh, brought out from Australia to the rest of the world. Um, and, uh, and it's, and it's uh, in pretty regular clinical use here. So I wanted to look more at alpha therapy, but in particular look at the new cancers that may be in, in the future being treated, particularly in the preclinical area. So unless you're a mouse, this isn't going to benefit from yeah. it. But, but, uh, uh, but uh, I'm going to talk to a company, uh, to um, Simon, he's from Advanced Cell, and, um, and, uh, and they're a, 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 a company that's got a new kind of alpha emitter. What, it's, it's, it's lead um, uh, yeah, 212. Yeah, lead 212. And, and it's got a pretty complex uh, uh, structure, but it may be ideal for this type of thing. Tell us a bit about yourself and your company and where this is coming. Sure, sure, Rob. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're Advancel, we're an Australian-based radiopharmaceutical company. Um, we, we are focused on targeted alpha therapies and as you say, we're, we're focused on lead 212. Um, when starting the company, we, we really reviewed the possible medical alpha emitting isotopes uh, and landed on lead 212 because the, the more we sort of read about it, the more we looked at the isotope, we, the more we thought this is an ideal isotope for radionuclide therapy. Um, it has a very short half-life relative to other therapeutic uh, alpha emitters, so 10.6 hours, which is really perfectly matched to the pharmacokinetic half-life of the ligands that we're, that we're putting these, these radiometals on. The other thing that really sort of interested us about lead-212 was, was not so much the alpha emissions or the beta emissions, but really it was the gammas. Uh, and, and, and the gammas are, are interesting and I think very important for alpha therapies because otherwise without the gammas how do you do dosimetry right and how do you do your quality control uh, and how do you detect it if you spill it uh, and so th this was one of the one of the reasons we, we really liked lead 212 um, we, we knew the alpha emissions would be beneficial in in, in killing cancer cells that, that's right what, that's so almost alpha, a given alpha, um, alphas are amazing for killing cells because they've got yeah. such a big punch they, exactly they knock that knock they, they knock to pieces the cells and they've got a very short range. So they're not affecting the cancer cells around it too much, but exactly. they may be affecting uh, cancer cells that may be distant because it, they do seem to be beneficial in terms of how they manage the immune system, upregulating the immune system, yep. um, some of the other crossfire effects, those types of things that are, that are happening um, uh, with alpha, alpha emission. And, um, and, and, and it's interesting, some case studies with alpha emission in prostate cancer have shown it's working where perhaps the traditional beta emission lutetium isn't working. Yeah, and I think we will, we're, we're right at the beginning of the journey of, right. of, of alpha therapies. This, this, this is the start. There is a very long way to go. And I think as we progress through this field, we will start to understand that cells react differently to different types of radiation. Uh, and I think we'll start to understand that the cells around those cells react differently to those yep. cells being yep. affected by different types of radiation. So it's going to be very, very complex how we manage right. these therapies. But, but we, yeah. need, we need gammas to manage it, right? But we need the gammas to manage it, exactly. Right. So we need to know what dose uh, people are getting and more importantly, what the variability in that dose is. Everybody hasn't got exactly the same size tumour in exactly the same organ and they haven't got the same renal function, they haven't got the same liver function, they haven't got all of those kinds this of things it. that are going to affect the, the dissymmetry. So we need a way to track that. And and maybe it's just a red herring, but, but yesterday I saw this in a <laughs> NEMA phantom, right? We saw the um, uh, and it's a very complex decay chart, this, uh, this led to it. But, but I was shocked because I saw this decay, it was emitting 
uh, alphas and, and, and gammas and things like that. And then they put this phantom inside a PET scanner. But it's not emitting any positrons. Why would you put it in a PET scanner? And there was the PET pictures. And they asked, why is that? Well, I stuck my hand up. I said, uh, it's pair production. And indeed it was. Yeah. So th it's got one very big, powerful gamma, right? It does, yeah. <laughs> so like you say, the, the decay chain is, is complex compared to the isotopes that we're normally working with in nuclear medicine. Um, and, and one of those daughters is, is thallium-208. And that thallium-208 has a very high energy gamma, 2.6 MeV. Uh, and nothing we use in nuclear medicine really has 2.6 MeV even with remote. gamma. Isn't there? Not even close. <laughs> right, so straight through the scanner, out the other side. Pretty much. So this, <laughs> this is a very strange thing to encounter in, in, in nuclear medicine. And when we were first, you know, when we first produced lead-212, which we, we now make daily in, a, in, in, in Brisbane, um, we, we were working with some of the physicists at the, at the Royal Brisbane Hospital uh, and, and we were sending lead backwards and forwards, doing all the fundamental stuff you do when you have a new isotope and learning how to clean it up when you spill it and, and understanding what the dose rates were going to be. And of course we tried to image it and we thought we were very excited about lead 212 spec. That was one of the reasons we chose lead 212 as an right. isotope is because we thought, you know, if you make a pharmaceutical out of this, you can put your patient in a spec scanner and you can confirm where it's gone. The fundamental questions we need to know from a new drug. We can, we can scan them, we can see where it's gone, we can calculate the dosimetry. These are very important things to progress the therapeutic. Uh, and then yes, Matthew Griffiths at, at the Royal Brisbane Hospital decided to chuck it in the PET scanner. And I was exactly the same as you, Rob. What are you doing? Where, there's no positron emissions. Uh, and he's just, just you watch. Uh, and I, I saw the image. Matthew, I'm a chemist. What on earth is going on there? <laughs> and he, yeah, he walked through this this pair production um, thing that I'd never heard of before. Right. So, uh, and so just, we've, we've just we've just had um, a whole lot of aurora uh, australis, which is the uh, in in Melbourne in 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 South Australia too, where we've seen the the southern lights in the sky, and that's caused by to a degree, the pair production wow. from the from the gammas from the sun. I don't know whether you know. That. I didn't know that at all. So, <laughs> so <yeah>. okay. <laughs> so 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 the, that's the only other place we've seen it when we look up. So yeah. so it's crazy that 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 suddenly we've seen a seen a, seen an application for that. I mean, one of the issues with so many different daughters, though, when you label it with something, how do you know it's going to stay labelled? And then how do you know where those daughter products, like the thallium, we know that thallium behaves like potassium, so it goes everywhere, right? How are you going to manage that, do you think? Yeah, so, okay, now, now I can put my chemist's hat on and, and talk about some, some radiochemistry. Um, so the, the lead 212 that we, we make is we start the radio labeling effectively in equilibrium. Um, so we, we know where we, at least we know where we start. The, the molecules that we're labeling, um, we will label the lead, we will label the bismuth, um, we won't label the thallium. Right. Uh, and, but because all of these isotopes have appreciable gammas, we, we can follow them. Ah. You know, we can follow them, at least, chemi at least chemically. We can, we can see them on a multi-channel analyzer. So, right. And we can see them on an HPLC. Right. So we can, we can see the bismuth separate to the lead, separate to the thallium on, on an HPLC. And so we can very clearly understand where each of these daughter products are, are going to be in that injectable dose. Now, once they get into the patient, of course, biology does its thing and, and completely wrecks that equilibrium. Um, but when we, when we look at the dosimetry from this, what we really care about is the bismuth, because right. the, the bismuth delivers 97% of, of the absorbed dose gotcha. uh, to that cell. So from the perspective of the thallium, it, it will not be attached to the molecule when it is born, it it is really born anyway. into existence, but it doesn't really matter because right. it's of such a low activity and it has such a short half-life. And the life. bismuth is being labelled anyway. So. And the bismuth is being labelled by the, by the, the chemistry. Um, and, and we can also follow the bismuth staying retained when the lead decays. Right. So when the lead decays to the bismuth, we can measure that the bismuth stays where it should stay. Um, so to all intents, it, it, it is complex, um, but the chemistry does its job. <laughs> well, it's fun anyway. It gives us, it gives us jobs. It's there. very fun. It, it, yeah. It's very fun. And I'm very excited to see what can happen with pear production pet because this is a whole new world. Well, it <laughs> might give better accuracy in the location. It's going to be very low abundance, right? Yes. But, yes. but, but, but it might, might do that. Okay. What, what things are we going to label with this? 
What what chances are we going to go up? We realistically, I, like I said, we were at the beginning of alpha. Yeah. We really are right at the beginning of alpha therapy, and I think there have been talks here today about new molecules for you know for for liver carcinomas. There right. have been talks here during during this session about new molecules for ovarian cancers and for breast cancers and pancreatic cancers. And I think we over the next ten years we're going to start to see those those molecules emerging. And I mean, you had melanoma as well, that's one of them. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, metastatic melanoma, again, and there are molecules that exist for, for metastatic okay. melanoma. We've, 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 seen, uh, we've seen spec scans of some of these molecules published. Um, so I think the, the world of Theranostics is going to get very big, very quickly. Um, <laughs> well, that's, that'll be fantastic, because it's made such a huge impact in cancers that we once thought were completely untreatable, yes. and we're having really good results for them. And we're also learning about how to, even if they don't get great results, how to upregulate the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the treatments of, of for example, uh, uh, neuroendocrine tumours and uh, our iodine tumours by, by well, this is redifferentiating. It, you know, sort of fantastic talks about right? how to so, redifferentiate cancers to express the, you know, so that you get better iodine uptake and you can then treat <coughs> patients that wouldn't have been treatable with iodine. Exactly. With iodine. I, so, so... Is there nothing we can't fix with this stuff? I, I, I think I think the sky's <laughs> the limit, Rob. You know, it's um, and and I think the, the the world is accepting that as well. Because you know, the last three years have seen so many biotechs pop up left, right, and centre. We're all all going after many many cancers and many new molecules to to treat with theranostics. Um, and I think we we can label all of them with lead two twelve, and there are going to be some fantastic you know right. clinical and studies we can not only go that down. we're picking the tough ones. We are. <laughs> We're picking the tough cancers, you know, not the easy cancers, you know, these tough cancers, that these metastatic tough cancers that people once thought were completely gone. We're really starting to work on that. And, and once we've developed the methods and we're developing the methods, we've still got a long way to go with alpha therapy. And, we do. And, and we've still got a long way to go to measuring it and, and doing the dosimetry, which is essential in that workup. But we've, we've you know, we've discovered the formulas that we can apply to these right of cancers. And I think uh, with nuclear medicine, uh, with the whole range of people that we need, uh, I've done a podcast on a neuroendocrine, with a neuroendocrine nurse who, who's doing a fantastic job. And I think there's a whole team of professionals related to nuclear medicine that are going to be essential for this to happen. And, and of course, going right back to the beginning, the most essential one is the chemist, right? You'd have I, to agree with I, that. I would, as a chemist, I would have to agree with that. We, 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 we can't do anything without the chemists. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, that's fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about add, add to what we've said? No, I think it, it's, it's, it's been a, a great discussion. I think it's important. Like, this is such an exciting time yeah. for, for nuclear medicine. It really has just, I think, minds have been blown oh. with where this could go. Yes. Um, I think we, we, need to, we need to put one foot in front of the other. That's right. going to be very important. We're at the start. There, there are a huge amount of unknown unknowns in, in the future. But there is a huge amount. But we've, we've been here before. We've been here before. And we've walked all the way from the beginning, all the way to the end. People are across Australia, in the most remote towns in Australia, are benefit, benefiting from Theranos. And you can't get anything more remote than the outback towns of South Australia. And yet they're being treated here. If we can do that, then I don't think there's anything we can't do. Fair point, fair point. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks. All right, well, thanks, Rob. Okay. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll see you next year. <laughs> see you next year. <laughs>